Okay, so the last podcast um, dealt with mitosis, about how cells copy their genetic material and then divide that genetic material and then divide the cells themselves so we can create two new identically uh, two new identical cells, cells identical to each other and identical to the parent cell from which they came, genetically identical. Okay, this is going to, uh, I hope, lead us directly into uh, DNA replication. That being, um, you know, it's one thing to say that the, the chromosomes copy themselves, the chromosomes replicate, uh, but the mechanisms of how they do that uh, and understanding those is another thing altogether. How can a DNA molecule copy itself so that it can be passed on to generation after generation? Um, DNA is an immortal molecule. It never dies. It gets passed on and passed on and passed on uh, to offspring, offspring, offspring. So um, how how can that be? How can a, a, basically an inanimate thing, a molecule, live, copy itself over and over? Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about uh, with this PowerPoint. Please understand that DNA is there to do two things. It is there as a means of getting the genetic information from one generation to the next, from parent to offspring, as um, just a way of passing information. But the other thing it must do is it must direct the creation of that offspring generation. It must cr direct the creation of a living thing and it must direct how that or living thing is going to function. Those are two separate problems. The passing of the information and then actually using that information to create the living thing. So it's very important. We are going to be learning a whole lot about the DNA molecule, some of which you should remember from your first year in biology when you were in a freshman or whenever that would have been. Um, but uh, we're going to go into it into some more detail. So this um, first part that we're dealing with in this set of PowerPoint uh, of um, podcasts is how DNA can copy itself simply so that it gets this information to the next generation. Then later we'll talk about how it can um, actually be used to create a living thing, to create the next generation, so to speak, uh, and, and allow that, that living thing to function. So right now we're going to start with talking about uh, the structure of the DNA molecule, okay? Uh, because in order to understand how DNA works, the first thing we must understand is how it is built at the molecular level. Okay, so um, I think we've already just talked about this. It's important. DNA is important because it is the genetic material. Um, and why is that important? Uh, we've just mentioned that. It uh, tells each living cell how to create itself, how to function, and it allows the information to be passed to offspring generations. So we've already got that now. Please remember, this is going to take us back to our initial biochemistry units. Remember, there are four groups of major groups of organic compounds. There's carbs, there's lipids, there's proteins, and ta-da, nucleic acids. So that's what we're going to be talking about when we're talking about DNA. It's a nucleic acid. <coughs> and if you'll recall, um, when we were talking about uh, organic compounds. We often were talking about polymers. Um, and so this picture uh, should look fairly familiar. If you'll remember, uh, nucleic acids are polymers. They are very large molecules made out of many smaller subunits. So in this diagram, this great long string of circles connected by lines is representing a polymer, and I'm telling you it's a nucleic acid, so you'll have to trust me on that. Um, now, the polymer is made up of many 
monomers. Okay, each circle is representing a monomer. If this is in fact a nucleic acid, as I told you it was, then these monomers have to be nucleotides because the nucleotides are the little building blocks that make up a whole nucleic acid. So each of those monomers would be a nucleotide. Okay, now that said, each nucleotide is composed of three parts. So each of these nucleotides, each of these little circles in our little train, by the way, the solid lines are covalent bonds connecting each nucleotide to the other, but these are made up of three smaller subunits. These nucleotide monomers are in fact made up of one, two, three subunits that are all connected together. The whole thing's still a monomer, but it is made up of three smaller parts. So each nucleotide then is made up of a sugar, which we will diagram like this, a phosphate group, oh, I'm sorry, out of sync here, a nitrogenous base, which we'll diagram like that for the time being, and a phosphate group. This entire structure all three of those together is a nucleotide, okay? And you would link a bunch of these units together to make a nucleic acid, okay? Now, of these three parts that make up a nucleotide, this is the only part that can vary, okay? No matter what nucleotide you have, there are four, four possible different nucleotides, okay, that exist chemically. We'll have an exception to that later, but there's four possible ones. For each of the four different possible nucleotides, the phosphate's always the same, the sugar's always the same, it's the base that can vary, okay? Now, the bases, these nitrogenous bases, we're just going to call them bases because that's easier. Uh, they exist in essentially two kinds of families, uh, purines and pyrimidines. I personally think this is a, a kind of a I mean, it's not, the overall concept's not petty, but to ask you to remember purine versus pyrimidine, I think kind of is, but sometimes it does show up on the test. The only way I can remember which is which is that purines are made up of two carb, two rings of carbon, as you can see here, all of them um, are made up of two carbon rings attached together, and pyrimidines are only made up of one ring. Okay, um, so the small word is the bigger molecule, two rings, whoops, molecule, okay, um, and the big word is the smaller molecule, all right, but um, pyrimidines, the bases that are classified as pyrimidines are these, and we'll talk about uracil later, let's ignore that one now, cytosine and thymine. These two are in the same chemical family. Purines, we'll talk about uracil later, purines are adenine and guanine. These are the basic four nitrogenous bases found among the DNA nucleotides, adenine and guanine. So these two are in the same chemical family, and these two are in the same chemical family, okay? Um, so we'll talk more about that in a bit. Let's go back to uh, one of the other components of nucleotides, and that's the sugar, okay? There is a, f uh, the, f the sugar that is in DNA is a five carbon sugar, pentose, pentagon, pentose five, okay? Um, and in DNA, that sugar, that pentose sugar, is called deoxyribose, hence that's how DNA gets its name, uh, DNA deoxyribonucleic acid, all right? Um, we'll talk about RNA later. Let's not talk about that now. Um, in this sugar molecule, this point right here in this ring, these all represent carbons, every bend in the ring represents a carbon, and then there's a carbon right here. There's your five carbons. Right here though is an oxygen. Now, there's something you need to um, understand, because this is going to be important later. By 
chemical notation convention. That's just, this is what's done. When you have a ring of carbon molecules like this, it, there's this oxygen up here obviously is not carbon. So we start at the first carbon to the right clockwise from the oxygen and we call it carbon one and it's one prime. I don't know why we have to call it one prime, just accept that that's what we call it. The second carbon is the two prime carbon, the third is the three prime, the fourth is the four prime, and then this fifth one is the five prime carbon. And they are numbered that way and we refer to them that way. It is going to become important later. The three prime and the five prime carbons are going to be very important for the DNA molecule. The other ones we will never mention again. We need to remember three prime and five prime and where they are. Okay? Now, the phosphate group. The phosphate group is always, always attached to this five prime carbon. Okay? Um, and that's going to be something you need to remember. That will be important later. Now, um, what we're seeing here, this is a nucleotide. There's the base thymine. Notice it's only one ring, so it's a pure, this is one of the purine family. Here's your five carbon sugar, the, the, the deoxyribose. There's your phosphate attached to the five prime carbon. Here is the next base. Here, I'm sorry, the next nucleotide, here's the next nucleotide, here's the next nucleotide. They are being connected in a chain by this, this, this. All of those are covalent bonds that connect one nucleotide to the next, to the next, to the next. If you will notice, it is the three prime carbon that connects to this phosphate. 3 prime carbon connects to this phosphate. 3 prime carbon connects to this phosphate. So that's why the 3 prime and the 5 prime carbons are important. 5 prime carbon important because the phosphate connects to it. 3 prime carbon because that's the one that connects to the neighboring phosphate. Okay? So, just so you know, if you'll recall, sometimes those covalent bonds had special names, for example, a peptide bond between two amino acids. Well, this is called a phosphodiester bond. Remember ester bond's uglier sister, phosphodiester, she's right here. And so this is called a phosphodiester bond. It's a covalent bond linking two nucleotides. If you ever see it, you know what it is. Okay, so they are formed between the sugar of one nucleotide and the phosphate group of the next. So between the sugar of this nucleotide and the phosphate group of this one, sugar of this one, phosphate group of this one, sugar of this one, phosphate group of this one, okay? Now, the sugar and the phosphate, and they've highlighted them in this light blue here, they make up the backbone of any nucleic acid. These are strong covalent bonds. They are not easily broken. This is the backbone. Phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. That's the backbone. Phosphates and sugars are always the same. Um, always. The bases over here, they may vary, okay? They may vary. This could just as easily be an A, a, a adenine, as it could be a T or a G or a C. It could be a cytosine or a guanine. These can vary, but these, this is always phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, always. Okay? Now, the DNA molecule then is composed of two strands of these these polynucleotide molecules, many nucleotides, two of them that are hooked together spiraling around uh, this imaginary axis. So we would have one strand and then another and they are twisted around each other. Okay, we know that as the famous double helix. Okay, and we're going to talk some more about that. Alright, um, the way they get hooked together. All right. Here is a great little diagram. We've got the phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar right here. Okay. All right. And that's the same on this side as well. Okay. They, these phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, well actually sugar phosphate in this case, 
they are the backbones and they are on the outside of the helix. So what we see in this diagram here, ye yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, that's the sugar phosphate backbone, okay? What's on the inside of the double helix are the nitrogenous bases. And what you should notice is there's a purine with its two rings and a pyrimidine with its one ring. It's always two to one, two to one, two to one. It's never two and two. It's never purine plus purine or pyrimidine plus pyrimidine. It's always the purine plus pyrimidine combination. So what that means is A always pairs with T and C always pairs with G. They always fit like that. If you see a T over here, you don't even need to know uh, what's uh, you don't need to see the side to know it's there. You know it has to be an A. So T is always paired with A. A is always paired with T. Adenine to guanine. I'm sorry, adenine to thymine, guanine to cytosine. And how are they paired? There are hydrogen bonds that link the bases together in the center. Please remember that hydrogen bonds are re reasonably weak, com certainly compared to covalent bonds. They're stronger than nothing, but they're kind of weak. What that means is this will s these hydrogen bonds will stabilize the molecule in the center, and here you can see them running down the middle right here, but they can also be easily broken, and that's really important for how this molecule works. Okay, so hydrogen bonds, Covalent, those phosphodiester bonds. The hydrogen bonds are relatively weak. The covalent bonds are very, very strong. And this question down here, how do the nature of these bonds fit the mechanism for copying DNA? We'll talk quite a bit about that uh, in just a, a little bit. Okay? Um, all right, so this we already talked about. It's always purine plus pyrimidine, cytosine plus guanine, adenine plus thymine. So, and this is showing you the relationship. We've already talked about it there, there. Always remember, if you see A, you know T is on the other, complement to the other side. If you see G, you know C is going to be on the other side. And these bonds here are hydrogen bonds right there in between them. Okay, this is a really important word then, complementarity, okay, and it refers to the A to T, C to G relationship. The two strands that are spiraling around are said to be complementary. A is always going with T, C is always going with G. That means that each is a very predictable counterpart to the other. This is really important. If you've got A on one side, you know T is going to be on the other, for example. Okay? Now, um, discovering what we have just talked about, how that DNA molecule is built, is incredibly important for determining how it works. Um, that was the hope, in fact. They hoped that if they could figure out how the DNA molecule was built, that then they would have some insight into how it works, and it could not have been more clear, okay, once they figured it out. Now, quick little history lesson, and then we're going to stop and cut this off, and then we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up again. Uh, Linus Pauling was a very, very famous chemist uh, back prior to and during the time that DNA was discovered. He discovered the structure, the um, alpha helix structure, spiraling structure of certain proteins. He knew a lot about proteins. And it was pretty much assumed that this guy, since he knew so much about biochemistry, was going to figure out how DNA worked too. He didn't. Um, but it was thought he would. Uh, for a while, I think everyone thought that, well, I know everyone thought that, that um, in fact, the genetic material wasn't DNA at all, but was, in fact, protein. It was thought that proteins were really complex molecules, and, gosh, the genetic material must be complex, right? So it was thought that proteins must be it. They, some people thought that DNA couldn't possibly be the genetic material. It was too chemically simple. Um, and the reason they thought uh, aside from that, the protein was probably the uh, uh, genetic material was because 
DNA and protein are very closely uh, intertwined within chromosomes. Uh, if you look at chromosomes, you've got your DNA molecule here. There's your double helix, okay? Uh, but in fact, the double helix is wrapped around, if, if this cord is the DNA and my finger is going to represent this yellow blob here, DNA is actually wrapped around certain blobs of protein like thread around a spool to help it keep it organized. That's why you put thread around a spool so it won't get all tangled up. Well, these proteins have a name and they are called histone proteins. And for a long time, people thought that the protein they were seeing mixed in with the chromosomes was in fact probably the genetic material. We now know that it's not, but uh, it's important to understand that these histone proteins were, were confusing to people for a time. They didn't realize they were acting as spools for the DNA to wind around. It was thought they probably carried significant genetic material. Um, now I'm going to skip past this and get back to our little history lesson for a second. Um, Rosalind Franklin uh, was a very, very excellent technician she, and, and scientist. She did a lot of work making images of molecules, which is kind of mind-blowing to me, but she did it using x-rays, a technique called x-ray crystallography. And um, she came to work in the, I'm going to skip past this, in the lab of this man, Mar uh, Morris Wilkins, uh, at King's College in England. She worked with him. It was not a great working relationship. Um, they had a lot of miscommunication and misunderstanding. She was a woman in a very, very male-dominated field, and even though she was very, very, very good. Uh, she didn't get a lot of respect for what she did and so on. But she was working in his lab and made fantastic images uh, of DNA molecules that are here. Now to us this looks like nothing like a DNA molecule, but if you were a scientist that worked with the stuff you would understand that this image is, is telling you a whole, whole lot of information about the molecule. Um, and this she numbered photo 51. She had many, many series of photo images, and this was one of the best ones. Well, um, Morris Wilkins, um, well, let me, before I tell you about what he did, let, let's go on to some the other players in this, the most famous players in the whole discovery of DNA. Uh, James Watson was a very, very young American, uh, prodigious genius guy, very young graduated from college extremely young uh, and and ended up in England at um, the uh, same school at, at Cavendish uh, it, with and ended up getting roomed with uh, Francis Crick who was considerably older probably 15 years older than than was James Watson they ended up realizing they had something in common they were interested in the DNA molecule they thought it was probably the genetic material and they, so they started tinkering uh, with building models of it uh, even though they didn't know a whole lot about it um, and ultimately what happened was uh, they were friends with Morris Wilkins and he kind of off the cuff showed them this picture of what uh, Rosalind Franklin had developed and using this they were able to finally build a very accurate model of the DNA molecule. Um, they realized uh, that uh, the A's and the T's had to uh, meet in the middle and the C's and the G's as well and the phosphates and the uh, uh, the beta, the uh, sugars rather were on the outside. Um, they published in their findings in 1953, um, and that changed everything about uh, what we knew about life. We and and has led to all, all the genetic discoveries that came after. Um, this is a shot of them. Uh, Crick is passed away. Uh, Watson is still alive, but this is a photo of them with their actual model that they built. Um, and this quote, uh, at the end of their paper where they talked about what they had discovered, they said, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing, the A to T, C to G pairings that they had discovered, 
uh, we have postulated immediately suggest a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. So in discovering the structure of that molecule, they were able to realize that this must be telling them a whole lot of information about how this thing could copy itself. If the molecules, if you had a T over here, you would know that you needed an A to make a copy of this molecule. And we'll see how that works, OK? So the big question then is how does this duplication of the genetic material actually happen? On the surface, it's pretty simple. We know if we have an A on one side, we need a T on the other. But how molecularly, mechanically, can this occur in a cell? Um, we are going to learn in more detail how this occurs. And yes, don't thank me. I, I know you're, you'll be thrilled. But uh, we are going to learn all about how DNA gets replicated, how it is copied. And remember, we only copy it just to pass information on to the next generation. This isn't going to tell us anything about how DNA creates your body, how it helps your body function while you're using your body. We are just learning about how DNA gets copied so we can give a set to offspring. Okay, so that's it for this podcast, and we'll see you uh, next time when we talk about DNA replication. Thanks for watching.